All right. So I'm, you know, I'm more known for my research on Pavlovian conditioning uh, as a model of emotional behavior in rats. So you might wonder what I'm doing here. And I might wonder what's going on. Why am I here? <clears throat> so, all right. Maybe, you know, it's end of career self-indulgence, you know, old folks talking about consciousness and stuff. Or maybe they ran out of options. <clears throat> Or they needed a New Yorker. I don't think it's any of those, but um, you know, I actually have a 45-year connection to consciousness that predates my work on uh, all this other stuff. I did my PhD studying consciousness, conscious and unconscious processing in split-brain patients, working with Mike Zaniga. And we, we did this one study that I'll just, uh, so the only one I'll mention. So split-brain patient, left visual field is shown a picture of a snow scene, right visual field of a chicken claw, um, the left hand points to the shovel, the right hand to the chicken claw, makes sense given what they saw. But then we asked the left hemisphere to verbally describe why he did what he did. So he says, well, I saw a chicken claw, and so I picked the chicken, and you need a shovel to clean up the chicken shed. So he, can, he created a story, a narration, to make his left hand's behavior make sense to his left hemisphere, which did not see the snow scene. Uh, so the hypothesis we came up with is that we humans think that we control our behavior. And observing behaviors that are controlled non-consciously is discomforting. It produces cognitive dissonance. Given the multiplicity of non-conscious uh, behavioral control systems in the brain, dissonance-reducing narratives may help uh, maintain a sense of mental unity. So from this, uh, I decided that I wanted to study emotional behaviors because I thought they might be the kinds of behaviors that compel these dissonance-reducing narrations in us. Um, and because of the lack of tools available for studying the human brain at that time, I turned to rats since the circuits underlying the control of emotional behaviors were thought to be conserved. So, but even though um, what I was working on was, had very little to do with consciousness, uh, I always wrote about consciousness in my books and even in some review papers. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about a new book that's coming out in, um, in October it's called The Four Realms of Existence, and it takes a new look at the science of what and who we are. So it kind of, and what I'm trying to do here is put consciousness in a broader biological context. So many of us understand that the mental aspect of who we are is embedded in the part of the body known as the brain, and therefore is also part of our physical bodily existence. Still, even true believers of the physical nature of the mind sometimes feel as though it possesses qualities uh, that are lacking in other physical systems within our body and even within our brain. We have firsthand knowledge of the mental states we refer to as perceptions, memories, emotions, thoughts, but lack awareness of the processes that control digestion, respiration, heart rhythm, and so forth, and much of behavior. What is it about the mental stuff that makes it seem different from the rest of the physical stuff that constitutes who and what we are? Just as your mind depends on your brain, and your brain being a part of your body depends on the life-sustaining functions of other components of your body. If your heart stops beating or your lungs collapse, all, of, all other organ, organs, including your brain, will soon cease to function in a way that's compatible with life. Without bodily life, there's no brain function. Without brain function, there's no mind. How then, out of all of this biological physicality, do we each come to exist as a being that knows it was born in the past, exists now, and will someday die? So the standard approach to such questions about individuality is to focus on notions like self or personality. These have long guided uh, philosophical musings as well as scientific theories and research about what it is to be a human being. There's little agreement about what self and personality refer to, and even whether they refer to real entities as opposed to just being shorthand labels for a variety of psychologically interesting phenomena. So David Hume called the self the elusive I. Uh, Sean Gallard, despite the comfort level of the field to talk about the self, what is said is usually controversial. Daniel Dennett, the self is an illusion. Uh, Harry Stack Sullivan, personality is an illusion. Personality is a myth, Walter Michel. Uh, just because the self is in our vocabulary does not mean it has the, any explanatory value, or Owen Flanagan, and this is what I really like. Nobody ever had or was a self, Thomas Metzinger. So scientific discoveries over the past several decades from diverse fields such as quantum physics, genetics, and oh boy, artificial intelligence now, have led to new ideas about how, how human beings exist as physical systems. These findings and challenging, cherished assumptions about human nature have resulted in an epistemological vacuum. 
In no small part, this is because thinking about who and what we are has not advanced significantly beyond traditional ideas some put forth in, the, in, in ancient times. The various phenomena that have been discovered while studying self and personality have without question provided important insights into human nature. But what if our scientific understanding of what and who we are is confused? Specifically, what if our constructs is in, are ina inadequate as conceptual hooks on which to hang the empirical findings that have been discovered in their name? Because these centuries-old centuries old notions obscure as much as they reveal, maybe the phenomenon would be better served by a new conceptual home, one grounded in contemporary scientific conceptions and empirical research. So a human being can be characterized as a composite of four fundamental parallel entwined realms of existence that reflect our evolutionary past and account for our present ways of being. These are biological, neurobiological, cognitive, and conscious. All four are deep down biological, but the neurobiological realm transcends the mere biological, the cognitive transcends the mere neurobiological, and the conscious transcends the mere cognitive. They coalesce as an ensemble of being, and together the four realms and the resulting ensemble account for what and who we are, including those aspects of us that fall under the rubrics of self and personality. So this is not about reducing up higher levels to lower levels, as in the unity of science movement. It's instead about how symbiotic interactions between levels sustain the organism. So each realm anatomically permeates and physiologically enables the level above it. And at the same time, the survival potential of the level below is enhanced by the one above. The realms some uh, somewhat resemble the components of a Russian doll. But unlike a Russian doll in which the parts simply stack on top of one another, our component realms are conjoined, integrated, and interdependent. Everything about an individual human being, biologically and psychologically, is subsumed within the nested hierarchical organization of our realms of existence. So let's talk about what, the, what we're talking about here. So body functions are what the biological realm does. This is true of all organisms. Neural control, that's what the neurobiological realm does. The vast majority of animals we throw sponges out because they don't have a nervous system. Mental models, the cognitive realm some animals, and of course, subjective experience, some animals. Now, my goal is not to try to identify which animals are cognitive and are conscious. It's instead to better understand human cognition and consciousness in this framework. So let's start with the biological realm, life-sustaining bodily functions. So life depends on metabolism, life of the individual on metabolism and uh, bodily function, whereas survival of the species de demands replication abilities. Um, the, I want to just read a couple of things that uh, are relevant biologically here. Leo Buss proposed, new organisms not only possess novel features, but also retain features of the group they diverged from. New or newly changed features often become the primary target of natural selection going forward. Basic life-sustaining physiological functions have been repeatedly tested for their survival value and tend to change relatively little in the evolution of new species. More often, the changes involve new processes that control the way the organism's particular kind of body interacts with its environment in supporting metabolism and in sustaining life. John Maynard Smith saw the mechanistic, specifically a genetic explanation of how the transitions from lower to higher levels took place over the course of evolution. And we can see these in this uh, uh, Michaud's um, summary. Protocells with me metabolism replication abilities existed first. Then true cells came along with free-floating DNA, and then cells with sequestered DNA that sexually reproduced eukaryotes came along, uh, and then multicellular eukaryotes, plants, fungi, animals arrived. So we can see that at the bottom, the, uh, the prokaryotes don't have any sequ sequestration of the DNA, whereas the eukaryotes do, but the basic principles of the cell are retained as the eukaryotes evolved, they just added something new. And similarly, multicellular organisms took these eukaryotic cells, put them, put them together inside a, a larger membrane that created a, a, a whole organism, a large complex organism. And as you have more and more complex organisms, you get tissues, organs, and systems, and so forth. Okay, the neurobiological realm. So, okay, your nervous system's got central and peripheral components. Um, I want to read you something from Alfred Sher Sherwood Romer, a very prominent comparative anatomist in the mid-20th century. He said, in many regards, the vertebrate organism, whether fish or mammal, is a well-knit structure. 
But in other respects, there seems to be a somewhat imperfect welding, functionally and structurally, of two somewhat distinct beings. An external somatic animal, including most of the flesh and bone of our body, and an internal visceral animal, basically consisting of the digestive tract and its appendages, which to a considerable degree conducts its own affairs and over which the somatic animal exerts incomplete control. So we can put Romer's visceral and somatic systems within the central and peripheral nervous systems. Um, and when we do that, we can now relate body functions that uh, are in uh, uh, animals that lack a nervous system. Uh, they are simply biological realm activities. They keep the organism alive, the visceral and the somatic existing side by side, as Romer said. Um, but then with the evolution of nervous systems, first a simple peripheral nervous system, there was no centralization at first, the, the evolution of the nervous system evolves out of the body tissues that were present in unicellular uh, uh, organisms that predated the existence of animals. So with each level of evolution, something new is added. Uh, along comes the central nervous system and you have integrative processing and more complex uh, capacities. So through natural selection, the visceral and somatic functions of unicellular protozoan ancestors were carried forward into the nervous system when animals evolved and into a CNS when they diversified. So a defining feature of these neurobiological realm processes is stimulus-elicited automatic neural activities. For example, sensory motor integration in relation to reflexes, motor programs, instincts, fixed action patterns, Pavlovian conditioning, stimulus response habit learning, and so forth. No cognition required. So uh, this is the circuitry I worked on for all those years, studying rats and Pavlovian conditioning. Uh, with the amygdala as a recipient of sensory information, uh, then co separately controls visceral activities um, uh, that ultimately uh, lead to peripheral responses, and a CNS uh, that controls somatic activities that lead to behaviors like freezing and flight. Now, these things are not completely uh, separate because you need metabolism and all of the visceral activities to control the behavioral responses, and the behavioral responses are necessary in turn to control the, to support the visceral responses through metabolism. You have to search for food to, to obtain it and then uh, keep things going. So these circuits do not make conscious fear. They detect and respond to innate and learned threats with pre-programmed motor reactions. Fear is the conscious awareness of being in harm's way. We can make a similar point here about stimulus response learning, um, where the uh, presence of uh, the, the activation of a reinforcer, such as uh, the taste of food, will activate dopamine neurons. They release dopamine into the basal ganglia, uh, and as a result, sensory motor connections are um, solidified, and when the organism is later in the presence of the stimulus, the response will habitually occur. Okay, let's jump to the, the cognitive realm. So, it's relatively relatively easy to separate biological beings from non-living matter. If something's alive, it's a biological being. Deciding which biological beings exist neurobiologically is also relatively straightforward. If an organism has a nervous system, it's a neurobiological being, and by definition, it exists neurobiologically. That narrows things down to animals, or at least most animals. When it comes to the cognitive realm, things are considerably more complex. Because there are no physical properties that can be called upon to decide, to decide which animals exist cognitively, the workings of the cognitive mode of existence must be inferred from other properties, most typically from behavior, and that can be tricky because different scientists define cognition differently. So my definition that I'll be using the rest of this lecture is the capacity to construct mental models of the world and to use these in thinking, planning, deciding, and feeling. So there are landmarks in the history of these this middle model idea that I just want to briefly uh, uh, cover. Uh, we'll start with Crake and the nature of explanation in 1943. If the organism carries a small-scale model of external reality and of its own possible actions within its head, it is able to try out various alternatives, conclude which is the best of them, react to future situations before they arise, utilize the knowledge of past events in dealing with the present and future, and in every way react, to, react in a more fuller, safer, more competent manner to the emergencies which face it. Now, there are 
This was picked up on by Tolman, uh, who uh, discussed cognitive maps in rats and, in, and men in 1948. Kefu Nadel and the hippocampus is a cognitive map built on Tolman to, to discuss the role of uh, uh, mental models, a cognitive map in, in behavior. Johnson Laird talked about mental models towards a cognitive theory of science, language, the science of language, towards cognitive science of language, inference, and consciousness. And then more recently, we have the model-based and model-free learning uh, idea from Na, uh, Da, Niv, and Diane. So that's what I want to really focus on right now. Um, as recently as 1980, many animal psychologists were still under the sway of behaviorism and believed that rodents were mindless beast machines. Dickinson and Baleen said that you can't tell the difference between mindless habits and mindful goal-directed behaviors via your mere observation. It looks exactly the same whether an animal is responding habitually or on the basis of having a goal in mind. So they said rigorous re experiments are required, and they came up with a way to do this. They used so-called revaluation studies um, to show that goal-directed uh, behavior depends on the current value of a goal, but habits do not. So habits are model-free behaviors, goal-directed actions are model-based behaviors, and as a result, they are also um, uh, components of the neurobiological versus the cognitive realm. So Eric Kandel once noted that the evolution of novel behavioral, behavioral circuits often involve changes, changes in existing circuits, consistent with this idea that I mentioned earlier about the evolution of things start with uh, the old is used to uh, um, build the new. Uh, and that's true of these, the, the habit circuitry and its relationship to the model-based goal-directed action circuitry. In, in the light blue there on the uh, right side, you see the circuitry that we discussed earlier, sensory motor cortex, uh, basal ganglia. It, with the evolution of new areas of cortex involving prelimbic cortex, which uh, is a kind of... Uh, rodent version of working memory, uh, and orbital and insular and ventromedial prefrontal cortex, were, which are taking in metabolic and, and body state and, and need information. Uh, and all of that is being integrated into a, a, a model of the, of the environment that is different from what you see with simple goal-directed activity. It's a model that can be used to hold information in mind and make predictions about what to do. Okay, let's turn to the conscious realm, the topic of the conscious of the conference, obviously. So, is consciousness a scientific mystery? Thank you, David. <laughs> yes, in the sense that the mechanisms underlying biological inheritance are bacterial infections are mysterious before they were figured out. If something's not physical, then it's not a scientific problem. If it's physical, it's a scientific problem that can potentially be solved. Scientific pursuit of what it feels like to be conscious should not be limited by philosophical concerns about such feelings being too hard for science. If you make qualia out to be non-physical, you're making them non-scientific and setting up the scientific problem in a way that can only lead to failure. William James said, our reasonings have not established the non-existence of the soul. They've only proved its superfluity for scientific purposes. I think we could say the same thing about dualistic notions of non-physical qualia. They're perfectly fine as philosophical constructs, but not as scientific constructs. So some scientific notions of conscious. Creature conscious, of course, is the condition of being alive, awake, and behaviorally responsive to environmental stimuli. Of course, that exists in all animals. Mental state consciousness, the capacity to experience the world and one's relationship to it, only exists in some animals. Uh, and sentience uh, may exist more widely, but I think it's in need of a, a rigorous, consistent definition to fit it into this picture more comfortably. I'm going to focus here on, on mental state consciousness. Um, and research on the theories about mental state consciousness often focus on visual consciousness in two brain regions. This, of course, is a greatly oversimplified depiction, but visual cortex and uh, uh, lateral prefrontal cortex. So first-order theories propose that lower-order representations in visual cortex are sufficient. High-order theories propose that the first-order states have to be cognitively represented slash redescribed. So, a, visual, a focus on visual cortex and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is not sufficient, even for visual consciousness, I would maintain. In real life, as opposed to psychophysics labs, conscious experience is typically multimodal and involves a variety of lower order inputs. Further, uh, PFC circuitry is far more complex and its inputs are more diverse than typically acknowledged. So let's look at dorsal and ventral lateral prefrontal cortex in green there. 
and talk about their various inputs. So instead of asking about the, the information flow from sensory cortex to lateral prefrontal cortex, let's talk about the full range of inputs to lateral prefrontal cortex. So we we'll start with sensory. You've got visual, auditory, semantic sensory, and other sensory systems. What about memory systems? Medial temporal lobe, temporal pole, superior temporal sulcus, parietal occipital junction. And in addition, prefrontal circuits that themselves project to other prefrontal areas. There are subgranular areas like the orbital, ventromedial, and anterior cingulate, and granular areas like the frontal pole and dorsomedial uh, prefrontal cortex. So, um, just to, in case you aren't familiar with these terms, media, the, the sub... It's a little far, okay. Um, Subgranular cortex refers to these light gray areas here that are present in all uh, mammals like orbitofrontal, ventromedial, prelimbic, anterior cingulate, uh, and the darker gray refers to granular prefrontal cortex, which has special uh, cellular properties that allow it to do things more complexly than you can in the subgranular areas. So. Um, the perspective I want to present you with replaces the traditional volley between sensory cortex and lateral prefrontal cortex with a more complex anatomical arrangement consisting of a hierarchy of structures, each of which creates different kinds of states that are re-represented or re-described by circuits of prefrontal cortex and that contribute to higher order mental modeling and conscious experience. So let's look at it this way. Is this thing working? Okay, so up there you got some, you have sensory cortex top uh, right. Uh, now, that of course will project to uh, granular prefrontal cortex. Um, but you know, for complex stimuli, sensory information alone is not sufficient. You need some kind of memory to know what that thing is. You, an apple is not something you innately know. You have to learn that by uh, by using semantic memory or forming semantic memories about what these sensory stimuli are. Um, and there are many connections between memory cortex and sensory cortex. Some researchers even say that, that we shouldn't even talk about sensory and memory. We should talk about sensory memory cortex as a single thing. Um, now, once we integrate sensory and uh, semantic memory information, that becomes a perceptual kind of state that also reaches higher order uh, circuits up in granular prefrontal cortex. But memory information also goes to subgranular prefrontal areas, for example, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, where schema are continued after being initially uh, started in the uh, hippocampus. And those schema then are re-represented in granular prefrontal cortex as part of the mental model. So uh, Jorge Morales has described this in, in this way. In Ledoux's model, the representations processed by prefrontal cortex are diverse and redundant. They have different degrees of abstraction that reflect their origin in multiple kinds of systems, sensory memory conceptual. As a result, the focus of awareness can change as an, episodic, uh, as, as an episode develops over time. The system is dynamic and distributed. It has many backdoors and backups. This may explain why uh, lesions of prefrontal cortex have complex effects on consciousness. So, um, you know, you often hear about recurrency in relation to uh, uh, local first order kinds of theories, but recurrency is a feature throughout the cortex and probably throughout the brain. But let's look at it here. So we've got unimodal sensory cortex. Uh, you have recurrency within that, but also recurrency within memory cortex, recurrency within convergence zones, and recurrency between each of these. And when we go to uh, sensory memory conceptual, when we go to higher order uh, networks, we also have recurrency within each and between all of these. So the schema there and working memory mental models use the schema as a, a template for constructing the, uh, the model. So my, my views are clearly in leaning in the direction here of higher order theory. Uh, and this lecture is dedicated to friends and colleagues in this area who have influenced me greatly. Richard Brown, Aquan Lau, David Rosenthal, Matthias Michel, uh, Steve Fleming, and Axel Clermans. So let's, uh, let's forget about the brain for a minute and just talk about what happens in the world when we encounter a physical or social threat. I'm going to talk about the nervous system in terms of non-conscious, pre-conscious, and conscious uh, circuits here. Or not circuits, but functions. Um, okay, so the, the threat comes in, it goes to sensory cortex. 
Uh, memory is added to that to make it a meaningful uh, kind of stimulus. Um, but it also goes to threat detectors, for example, such as the amygdala, produce behavioral and physiological responses. Um, the memory uh, information is um, integrated in, by schema. Uh, the behavioral and physiological responses also influence schema, so you begin to construct a, a model or a situation about what's in the world uh, using all of the inputs that are put together by the schema to create a middle model. And then from there, going back to the split brain idea and from 1978, the output of all of that is an, an interpretive narr a narration that contributes to the emotional experience. So I want to talk about uh, what I'm trying to, for, as a, a kind of hypothesis about what these narr narrations might be like, be about, or might come about as, um, we'll take the cognitive interpretation narration idea, put it together, together with contemporary language of thought ideas, uh, and conclude that perhaps what we're talking about in these narratives is an abstract, amodal, Middle East story that is being generated non-consciously. So there's a lot of you know social psychology and 60s, 70s psychology that uh, uh, talks about the interpretive idea. Uh, and recently, there's been an in a revival of interest in the language of thought idea. Uh, for example, Escorla uh, has been talking about language of thought and cognitive maps. Franklin and Green talk about map-like representations in grid cells being responsible for these amodal kinds of representations that give you an abstract uh, quality of information that can be used in a, a variety of, uh, of, uh, of uh, situations in the brain. And Quilty Dunn talk about the synthesis of modern representational views. Okay. So I want to thank Matthias for the, uh, calling my, what I'm about to talk about, the ho-ho model of consciousness. <laughs> so the basic idea here is we have these lower order states, sensory, memory, linguistic, goal value, body state, that are integrated either within scheme or individually reach uh, uh, the middle model by itself. Um, so the idea is that the, um, the middle model one constructs a higher order representation, but in higher order theory, the higher order state is not conscious. Instead, it enables the consciousness of the lower order states in traditional higher order theory. David, so I think I'm, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, David. Um, so a second higher order state is required to be conscious of the content of middle model one, and so that's what middle model two does. This is the role of the narrative, which is not linguistic, visual, or any other kind of uh, modality. It's abstract or amodal. Uh, what about being conscious of the content of middle model two and three and so on? Uh, this is sometimes assumed to result in an infinite set of higher order states and kind of being impractical. But what I'm proposing here is with the higher order loop, this is avoided. So middle model two feeds back to middle model one and this loop allows mental model two to become conscious of a version of its own content, which is continuously updated via changes in the lower order inputs to mental model one. The inputs come in and they cycle through this so that what the mental model two gets in part will be what it receives from the uh, mental model one, which includes content about its own uh, content. So, uh, I think Hoho may also be quite, may be strongly related to Richard Brown's horror theory of higher, um, high order horror theory, but I'm not going to go into that now. Okay, so the abstract A model narrative not only spawns the conscious experience, but also verbal and nonverbal behavior. So here are some of the implications of what, I, uh, what I'm talking about. The modality free, abstract, A model nature of the narrative allows its conceptual content to be used by diverse downstream processors. For example, it allows one to respond verbally through speech, writing, or sign language, or non-verbally through a wide variety of distinct goal-directed behavioral actions, walking, running, swimming, climbing, hitting, hugging, pointing, waving, sticking up one's middle finger, frowning, smiling, sneering, or chuckling. Each distributary is a neural pathway that carries the Mendeley's narrative to its target circuit, whether it's speech, action, or experience. As a result, each process each, each processes the narrative signal in its own way, and the content reaching each target can vary somewhat because the full neural circuits are involved. For example, because verbal expression and overt action are different consequences of the preconscious uh, narrative, 
what we say and what we do can be somewhat discordant. This may also explain why verbal reports, though very reliable as a measure of momentary conscious experiences, do not always perfectly reflect those experiences. We can't always put into words everything we are conscious of, and why when stimuli are degraded or otherwise difficult to process, such as when they occur in peripheral vision, lead to incomplete reports. Okay, so let's move on now and take another wild leap into um, the idea that you could have, from the middle model two, you could have agency that allows you to um, control speech and writing and goal-directed behavior consciously. So, the question of whether we actually make conscious choices is, of course, a matter of debate, with some arguing that our sense of choosing is illusory. But even with free will, we can sometimes wrongly attribute conscious control to our behaviors. For example, this would happen when the conscious mental model notices uh, responses behaviorally that it did not control and then generates a rationalization to explain the behavior, telling more than we know, Nisbet and Wilson. Again, also the split brain findings are relevant. So, if I'm correct, the pre-conscious and conscious mental models can separately control overt behavior and verbal expression. The effort to scientifically understand, understand consciousness may be even more complicated than we thought, since it would mean that we never know in a given moment which mental model is in charge of what one says and or does. But if we know the problem, we can search for a solution that makes it a feature of consciousness rather than an impediment to understanding. Now, I did this, uh, gave this, note, this talk a part of it uh, at Yale, and in, in, I think it was in December, and a grad student, Joan Anjkoko, uh, had this to say afterwards in an email. And I think she's, it's really interesting what she has to say here. One possibility is the difference between verbal reports controlled by the two mental models lies not just in the superficial words, what people say, but in the relation between these words, how people move from one idea to another. This is a process known as semantic progression. The more implicitly, spontaneously constructed verbal reports that arise, uh, that arise from a pre-conscious state may involve more jumping from idea to idea compared to more intentionally constructed reports arising from the conscious model. Semantic progression has been measured through existing natural language processing models such as latent semantic analysis or unsupervised embedders that compute the semantic similarity between words and sentences. Words in the same paragraph should show greater semantic similarity than words across paragraphs. Indeed, these types of analyses have been used to explore the progression of ideas in narrative text and in film and might be leveraged to distinguish reports based on pre-conscious versus conscious states of mind. How much time do I have, Ned? Oh, okay. Oh, good. I, don't have to, I thought I was have to stop. Okay, so we often uh, hear about consciousness as if it's a single kind of uh, state. Um, an alternative to the unidimensional view of consciousness is Endel Tolving's trio of memory and consciousness. Tolving proposed three kinds of memory, or three memory systems, procedural, semantic, and episodic, all that all make possible the utilization of acquired and retained knowledge, but they differ in the kind of knowledge they handle and the way in which different kinds of knowledge are acquired and used. Each of the three memory systems is characterized by a different kind of consciousness. A noetic consciousness is temporally and spatially bound to the current situation. Noetic consciousness allows an organism to be aware of and to cognitively operate on objects and events and relations among objects and events in the absence of these objects and events. And autonoetic consciousness confers special phenomenal flavor to the uh, remembering of past events, the flavor that distinguishes remembering from other kinds of awareness. So each is also associated with a specific kind of memory. So autonoetic consciousness is associated with Episodic memory and results in self-knowing, a thick sense of self that I see the apple. Noetic consciousness, um, semantic uh, memory is, is related to semantic memory. And this is fact-knowing. It's a thinner kind of, there is an apple there, but you, know, you are not necessarily considering yourself as being involved in that kind of representation. And anoetic, which is based on procedural memory and is called non-knowing knowledge and thought is not involved. It's tacit self if, if any self is involved. Now, metacognitive uh, uh, basis of this has been proposed uh, by uh, Metcalf and Son, um, that explicit metacognitions about oneself would be uh, involved in autonoetic experience, explicit about facts and concepts, noetic experience, and implicit about here and now in anoetic. 
So every autonoetic state is accompanied by noetic and anoetic states, and every noetic state is accompanied by anoetic states. But anoetic states can exist alone. This is all Tolton. Now, the idea of noetic and autonoetic consciousness is straightforward. Anoetic is the problem. Tolving was more interested in noetic and autonoetic states and said relatively little about anoesis, other than it was not noesis or autonoesis, leaving a trail of confusion. What is non-knowing knowledge? And given that procedural states are implicit or unconscious, non-conscious, how can they be a kind of consciousness? So Larry Squire had this, uh, Larry Squire is, a, as you probably know, a well-known memory researcher, studied the hippocampus in memory for many, many years had this to say on procedural and non-declarative memory. Non-declarative memory is an umbrella term referring to multiple kinds of memory that are not declarative. Again, it's by the absence of being declarative that, uh, that non-declarative or procedural memory is defined. So given the diversity and lack of coherence of procedural memories, there could be degrees of unconsciousness among the various procedural non-declarative states. So mind reading talking me mind me reading talking. Maybe he was inadvertently riffing on what William James variably referred to as the fringe, penumbra, or halo of the stream of consciousness. Vague states that hover on the border of conscious and unconscious and allow explicit content fills conscious states to feel right. Uh, James's fringe and its feeling of rightness has been adopted and adapted uh, by contemporary philosophers. Bruce Mangan, for example, has written, Rightness represents the single most, mechanism, the most important mechanism controlling conscious, unconscious interactions and reflects the degree to which an explicit conscious content, explicit content and consciousness is compatible with its vast unconscious context. Rightness links these two cognitive subsystems into a constant and reciprocal interaction. His examples include gut feelings, metacognitive confidence judgments, tip of the tongue experiences, feeling of knowing, and so forth. Other examples include cognitive dissonance, uh, which results in a kind of feeling of wrongness when inconsistent beliefs sit side by side in the mind, and Oppenheimer's notion of fluency. The function of the fringe, according to uh, Magnum, is to represent in a highly condensed way the extensive body of unconscious contextual information that exists in the brain, thereby finessing the limited capacity of focal consciousness. By contrast, through working memory, stimuli can be selected and attended to in focal consciousness and result in articulable, introspectable, and reportable content. Fringe states nevertheless accompany explicit conscious states and imbue them with a feeling of familiarity and rightness, but in doing so, only make mental demands on working memory and articulation resources. Um, Coriat has referred to such vague feelings, uh, fringe feelings, as sheer subjective experiences that reflect implicit inferences shaped by unconscious processes that monitor memory representations and yield a present or absent conclusion rather than the specific content that you feel you know. This unconscious monitoring of memory is in effect what's called procedural or implicit metacognition. Steve Fleming has recently made a similar point that one being able to report on whether something is present or absent is different from reporting about whether the item, uh, the, uh, reporting about the awareness of the item in question. So if we take uh, focal explicit consciousness to encompass noesis and autonoesis and fringe consciousness to revert, refer to anoesis, the psychological relation of vague anoesis to explicit consciousness then becomes clear. Anoetic states are what give noetic and autonoetic states the warmth, tenderness, and intimacy that William James and Bain before him talked about. Sheer feelings about the fringe, in other words, are the, absent, are the essence of anoetic consciousness. So here we have focal consciousness in the middle, which would be noesis and, and autonoesis, fringe in the middle, and the, the vast unconscious on the outside. This scheme not only allows us to better understand human consciousness, but also allows us to reverse engineer what consciousness like, might be like in other mammals based on how their brains are similar to and different from ours. For example, every noetic state, as I said, is accompanied by an anoetic state, and every noetic state is accompanied by anoetic, but anoetic can exist alone. So here we have, as we talked about, the medial uh, green areas are subgranular areas present in all mammals. The blue areas are only present in primates. The red area uh, is a specific human uh, specialization. So if we knew more about consciousness, of these diff three different kinds of consciousness in the human brain, um, 
we might be able to reverse engineer. Let's just say for the sake of argument, the frontal pole is involved in this kind of uh, autonoetic self-awareness, self-reflection. The dorsolateral in uh, a semantic kind of working memory on noetic consciousness. And the green areas in autonoetic, in, in anoetic consciousness. Um, if we knew about this in the human brain, again, just as using this as a hypothesis, we could then reverse engineer what mammal consciousness might be like based on what we know about the areas of the brain that we share with all mammals and the same with other primates. Now, I just want to go back to one thing here and point out that uh, Jacques Pengsepp and, and Marie uh, van der Kochhoff have um, also talked about the uh, role of anoetic consciousness as a kind of fringe state, and I don't want to uh, overlook them. Okay, I just want to close with this quote from Herring, a, an important physiologist and psychophysicist in the late 19th century. Memory connects innumerable single phenomena into a whole. And just as the body would be scattered like dust in countless atoms if the attraction of matter did not hold it together, so, uh, hold it together, so consciousness without the connecting power of memory would fall apart in as many fragments as it contains moments. So again, this is from the Four Realms of Existence, October. Um, uh, there's also a documentary about my life, work, and music on Amazon Prime, if anyone's interested in that. Um, it features Mike Zaniga, Eric Kandel, Liz Phelps, Daniela Schiller, and several musicians, including Roseanne Cash, Lenny Kay from the Patti Smith Group, Elf Roscoe, Jeff Peretz, and so forth. And then, on the, uh, thank you, Ned, for mentioning the amygdaloids, but on Sunday night, the amygdaloids will have a, a gig at the, oops, uh, Rockwood Music Hall, 196 Allen Street. It's free, limited space, come early. It's at 10 p.m. Hope to see you there. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. It was a very interesting talk. I have two questions, so if they're both dumb, feel free to, to skip them. One is that you mentioned emotional experience, and I wonder if any experience is emotional experience, and where is emotion in the hierarchy of the ho-ho? And also, how do you define emotion? <laughs> I'm sorry if it's done. And the other one is um, when you describe towards the end the shared structures across mammals, it, why are we only looking at the cortex and not its subcortical structures? Okay. So first question, uh, I'm sorry, first, second question first. Um, you know, th this was just a hypothesis to talk about. Um, obviously, subcortical areas are very important in all of subcortical areas are very important in all of this, uh, but I was just giving you a, a kind of uh, uh, simple, there we go, okay. So just trying to give you a, a simple version of what I've been talking about. Um, now, I forget all the other things you asked about, except you, what is emotion? Well, I think both emotion and cognition are uh, things that, you know, humans have made up to categorize things that we don't understand well. But we put things into those two categories and we try to study them because they're interesting phenomena in our, in our experiences. Um, so the, you know, that's one of the reasons why I think there's no difference between emotional and non-emotional or cognitive consciousness. It's all uh, higher order representations of what, you, what is happening to you in the moment. Um, what did I miss about what this? It's good enough, okay. <laughs> Um, hi. Uh, so I'm going to read something out to you because it's a little long, and I want your thoughts on it. Um, it's like a sentence. Yes, it's a sentence. Um, so evolutionary theories posit both generalized cognitive capacities across like a wide range of species, and they also discuss how traits and abilities develop in ecological niches that adapt to those specific niches. So if we were to put consciousness in parallel to those evolutionary theories, do you think consciousness is a product of specialization or generalization? Well, I would say specialization, but that's just an opinion, and other, I'm sure other people have the opposite opinion in the room. But why do you think it's specialization? Well, because the way I think about consciousness is that it's an integrative process taking in all kinds of information, uh, at least human higher order consciousness. That doesn't mean there can't be sentience and other kinds of things that are more general and perhaps more basic. But what I'm trying to talk about here are these higher order states in, the, uh, in this way. Let's take two at a time. 
<laughs> Should I go first? Hi, thanks for the talk. I was wondering if you could gesture at experiments that could test your theory. Well, the, the only thing I can think of is the thing I mentioned that the young lady proposed. I'm at the point where I don't do experiments anymore. I'm closing my lab in August. Uh, so I'm just trying to like go off into the clouds and say things that are outrageous. I see. <laughs> Shall I? Okay. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. I wonder, um, you quoted at the beginning uh, various older psychologists who stated that kind of like unconscious behavior cannot be distinguished from conscious behavior, right? And I wonder whether the quote of the student... Uh, that was, that was uh, habit versus goal-directed behavior. Yeah. Those don't have to be conscious. Yeah. Okay, but I wonder whether the uh, quote of the student you, you showed us, yeah. who suggested that the semantic structure might be different for mm -hmm. goal-directed yes. or conscious behavior and unconscious behavior, would you, would you, so my first question would be, um, do I relate this correctly that you would, uh, that you t uh, quoted it because you, it is a sign that something is different in the goal-directed behavior, namely the structure of semantics, so to speak, and then an unconscious behavior? Well, but, you know, I, I don't think all goal-directed behavior is consciously controlled. So I would put that more in the cognitive realm. And then you can obviously have consciously controlled goal-directed behavior in, in this way I'm thinking about it. Um, but I wouldn't, I think maybe those two things are getting mixed up in, in the question you're asking. Okay. Um, uh, then the idea would be that uh, would you say that the conscious behavior or the uh, conscious mental model, so to speak, shows a different semantic structure yeah. than the unconscious? Yeah, that, but that was the point of that, that analysis you proposed. I, I'm sorry, so I, I, I got it like uh, the way a bit yeah. um, uh, quirky, but what I wanted to ask is whether you would also think that there's different perceptual structure, so to speak, for conscious and unconscious. That's uh, what kind of structure? Here. Um, perceptual structure, like whether, for example, yeah. there, could be, there could be psychophysical signatures of consciousness and the similarity structure of perception. Right, no, I think that's true. Yeah? yeah. Okay, yeah, that's easy. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Uh, just a quick question about uh, this anoetic consciousness and, uh, like, it's fringe character. Uh, let me let me just yeah I'm up here, I'm okay. here. Yeah. <laughs> so, and uh, my, my question is whether this would explain uh, the condition of a fantasia uh, fantasia right I'm not sure whether I'm uh, pronouncing correctly so just to give context to everybody uh, so it's the condition where people are able to perform consciously operations with working memory but they don't seem to have uh, imagery. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's uh, an interesting thing. I don't know a lot about that condition, but I, I think what you're saying has some value. It probably uh, could be relevant. Um, they, I mean, someone wrote to me with the condition. Uh, in her case, she lacked kind of any emotional feeling or association that went with uh, or more cognitive kinds of uh, uh, things. So I'm kind of interested in following that up, but I'm not that familiar with the condition itself. I'm going to ask a question. Okay. So, so much of the uh, the what goes on in the ASSC is about perceptual consciousness, but that really didn't figure much in your talk. Well, I so, think it's too much. Of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what is your view of perceptual consciousness? Well, I just want to say that you know, obviously, what I'm trying to do is I did this at my other ASSC talk uh, years ago that we need to then think more broadly about consciousness and, and how it relates to memory and emotion and other real life experiences. I have no problem with perceptual consciousness. I think, you know, all of the, the studies that are done are fantastic. We have fantastic work here at NYU in, in visual systems and, you know, great philosophy by you on how it all works. Um, and so, you know, maybe perceptual consciousness is a kind of high-level version of sentience, rather. So it's not a higher-order kind of state necessarily, but you might have some elements of that that are very basic and low-level. Oh, wait a minute. Did you just say that perceptual consciousness might not involve a higher-order state? Well, not, not if you're looking at a dot on the screen or a moving line or something. So I can be conscious of a moving dot with no higher-order state. 
I'm saying, <laughs> well, I, I mean, you know, I don't know, but I'm not, I won't, I don't rule it out. Well, you don't have to be, you don't have to be pure. <laughs> Life is complicated, you know, you have to. <laughs> Okay, I hope that was recorded. <laughs> um, I was wondering about um, the uh, endosymbiotic nature of like the the cell structure of you know life and how if we don't have uh, if we're not attributing a basic form of consciousness to a cell to be able to discern itself as apart from its environment, how it can enter into a symbiotic relationship. Well, you know that. It would not be the kind of consciousness I'm talking about here. Um, you know, and then now we're talking, I mean, I think, you know, we, we can talk about sentience in animals. Some people want to take that to cells. You know, do what you want. I'm not interested myself in that topic, but uh, I don't, you know, whatever. It's a, it's a big field and we have a lot to learn. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. It's just not where my head is and what I'm thinking about. Hello. Yeah, so I, I know Bruce Megan a little bit. He sends very long emails, by the way. I don't know if you've ever, ever uh, exchanged emails with him. They're very, very long. They're almost books and of their own themselves. So, anyway, so he talks a lot about, and he did this in his dissertation, he talks a lot about the aesthetic quality, right? That, that's where he started, and it's not about aesthetics anymore. He's extended it to this focus fringe thing. Um, so you have the anoetic, and then you have kind of this focused fringe, but I, there's also this sense in which kind of this meaningfulness is, extends over longer time periods. Um, and that wasn't really covered in these like three descriptions, but there's kind of this, like purpose or meaning that's a kind of a longer extended version, so. Only one question. Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying yeah, that, that's all the question is, is what, how does, is, is there an additional something you would add to that to cover it, or that be, because Sorry, I, who, did, who are you talking about? I missed the beginning. That's a Bruce Mangan. Oh. Yeah, okay. I guess he called Mangan. Or, yeah, yeah, Mangan. Um, say it again. Give me the point of the question again. Yeah, so there's there's folk, there's focus and fringe, and there's a noetic uh, unconscious right. thing. So is there a longer, kind of a longer uh, term sense in which those things are woven into like this grander sense of purpose that, that sometimes makes its way to consciousness. Yeah, or, I mean, that sounds original to me, but, I, you know, it's... Yeah. Uh, Sorry, it's a self-indulgent question, because that's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, no, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. No. So um, I'm I'm a psychologist, uh, and uh, I'm very curious. Do we agree on uh, how to define consciousness? Well, I think we have 700 different definitions in the room, probably. <laughs> I mean, you know, there are, there are these there are camps, right? Ned's in the first order camp. David and I and some other Matthias are in the higher order camp. There's you know, lots of uh, this global workspace uh, camp, and you know, we're all just trying to figure it out. It's not like you know, animosity; it's just ideas. You know. um, as a medical doctor, I spent many years listening to people reporting symptoms, which we don't do much in the world of consciousness about how brains do symptoms, which I think is an extraordinary area for investigation. But how does your model account for that, the fact that our brains seem to have a great interest while leaving us conscious, functioning in a minimal conscious state? I'm thinking of when people are lying in bed, like with very bad COVID, they're still conscious, but I'm wondering that, you know, our ideas get very metaphorical, but it, it seems to be an adaptive capability that, for example, if people have social anxiety disorder, their consciousness, when I listen to reports from patients, is very compacted right. and hyper-connected, whereas, like, for example, in being sick, consciousness is diffused. Question. Yeah. Well, I'm just asking for how his model accounts for that. That's the question, so, Mr. <clears throat> Philosopher. First of all, 
uh, I, you know, congratulate you as a, a medical person actually taking the subjective experience of the patient into consideration because the entire medical model of dealing with anxiety disorders is about metrics and behavior and physiology and so forth. So it's really important that we uh, listen to the patient. And the patients, you know, I mean, you, you can take notes on your patients and uh, maybe get some ideas about that. I don't know what's in, in their heads, though, so, uh, at this point. Sorry. Okay. Um, hello. Yeah, I'm just here. Um, so I see the... Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So the, the four realms, and I noticed, um, I just wanted to get your thoughts, because there, there was no, there was like, I was thinking social. So the what and the who we are, I wonder if you ever considered that. Yeah, I mean, I think, who. you know, yeah. I, in the book I make a point that, you know, one could also introduce culture and social interactions as realms, but I, I see those, at least at this point, explainable within the, you know, cognitive, conscious, neurobiological, and so forth. Uh, I don't think we have to like, generate an entire new thing, or at least that's as far as I went with it. Uh, next book, I might go into the, you know, the two more that, realms. That will be the last question. Let's thank Joe.